Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started, and so I will uh, officially get us going. Our first order is to do a roll call. So, uh, Steve Ball, Here. Phoebe, Here. Jen, Here. David Fisher, um, Delphine, yes, uh, Richard Rogers is missing, and Ron. Here. And then I'm Chad, I'm here. So we have a quorum. Do we have any changes to the agenda for tonight? No, we do not. Good enough. Okay, so the first order of uh, biz our business is approval of our minutes from last meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review and would anybody like to give me a motion? Uh, so moved to accept from last, the last meeting. And a second. Sounds good. All those in favor of accepting the meeting uh, minutes as presented? Aye. And all opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, so I think we are ready for our first agenda item. Jace, William, whoever's going to take the floor. Uh, good evening, Planning Commission. I'm just going to share my screen here real quick, get that PowerPoint on the screen. Before Jace gets started, uh, welcome to everybody. We usually get two or three folks in the audience, and so it's pretty room is impressive. Um, it's just nice to see everybody. So I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss later in the evening. Jace, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Planning Commission. So just, just for the record, I'm Jace Hawkwalt. I'm the Planning Manager here at the City of Montrose. Um, the item I have in front of you tonight is a request for a rezone of the property located at 820 6650 Road. That rezone is going to be from R2 to R5. The applicant for the request is also the property owner, uh, Rudy, Rudy Vargas, excuse me. Um, as shown on the slide here, the subject site is, is that site, uh, kind of irregularly shaped site outlined in red on the screen. Uh, this location, generally speaking, is in northeastern Montrose. Uh, so this slide here uh, just shows, again, kind of a zoomed in um, area of the subject site as well as the adjacent zoning. So the property as it sits is currently 1.1 acres in size and is vacant. Uh, it's currently zoned R2, which refers to low density districts, and the applicant is seeking a rezone to R5, which refers to low density manufactured housing district. Um, and, and really the purpose of that rezone is to construct a modular home on the site. Uh, modular housing is currently not an allowed use in the R2 zone district. Uh, this slide shows the kind of the zoning, rezoning criteria. Um, so the rezone should not adversely affect the public health, safety, and welfare of the community, and the request should be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, and those other two items, uh, the existing zoning, it, if, if that's not the case, uh, the existing zoning would be erroneous or conditions in the area affected or adjacent areas uh, would have changed, have, had to have changed materially uh, since the area was last rezoned. Uh, so the R5 zone district, which is being requested this evening, uh, is intended to provide a quiet, low density development for single family residences. Environmental protection is provided by allowing only single family residences with a certain other compatible, with, with other certain, or excuse me, with other uh, compatible land uses. This is kind of shown in the code. It's also shown in the, uh, the packet in, in my staff report. Um, so the picture here on site, this is actually the subject site just facing east um, there. So as you can see, it's uh, currently vacant. So this shows the uh, comprehensive uh, plan future land use map uh, that uh, on the right side that's just uh, zoomed out of the entire city essentially of that map to the left is uh, just a zoomed in area of the subject site there. Um, as, as shown the property is listed as residential mixed density low in that future land use map shaded in yellow there. Uh, the district provides primarily for single family homes as well as a small amount of attached residential dwelling units such as duplexes or even small groups of townhomes. So I pinpointed some goals specific to the comprehensive plan um, that, that this rezone actually does accomplish or, or staff feels that it accomplishes. I won't go into detail, uh, just given uh, the sake of time and the number of 
uh, community members we have in the audience here. But staff does find that the request does promote infill and redevelopment of an underutilized site uh, and does promote housing variety. And then lastly, uh, based on the preceding information, as well as the staff report provided in the packet, uh, staff has found that the proposal meets the rezone criteria, which are listed in section 4-4-29, subsection A, it, and is in compliance with the comprehensive plan, uh, and lastly, is compatible with the existing uses in the surrounding area. Uh, in conclusion, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of approval uh, to City Council for this rezone request. Uh, pretty brief presentation, that actually concludes it for me. Uh, happy to answer any questions, and I believe the applicant is also uh, here in the audience uh, for any questions. Okay, can we have the applicant come up and give us their presentation? I might have misspoke there. It actually would appear, I got a confirmation they would be showing, uh, but it would appear that they are not currently in attendance. Okay. So. Let me give you my first question. When you told, you've indicated that he wants to put a manufactured home on this lot, does this zoning allow for multiple manufactured homes once we've changed the zoning or is, and or additional dwellings in general? What does it allow once we change the, the zoning? Sure, so it, if it were rezoned to R5, uh, in theory, only, only one house could be put on one parcel. So they'd have to go through a formal subdivision process to add additional homes. Um, in theory, that is uh, something that could happen. With that said, this site is extremely constrained for a variety of reasons. Uh, access is one of those, but there's a significant easement, uh, drainage easement along the northern portion of this that I believe is actually 50 feet in width. So it really already limits the building envelope substantially for this site, or I should say the building area. So while it could be subdivided, while there might be able to, you know, in theory be a couple of units on there, I think it, it would be uh, pretty difficult to do so. So at this point, we're looking at only one manufactured home unless he goes through that site development process. That, that is all that's been, um, it, yeah, told to staff at this point. That's correct. Okay. And what? that was his intent. Correct. That's his intent, and that's what would, all that's allowed under the current... Without subdivision, and that would be another formal process that would come to, to city staff, of course, yes. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? Do you no? know if he plans to make that his residence or is that something that he was just going to build? The, out? I, I don't have that answer, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, I apologize. Uh, I did, like I said, I received confirmation that they would show, but I understand life also happens at the same time. So um, I, I can't answer that. That's fine. I'm going to go ahead and open the public um, comment section. I'm going to read a statement that deals with our public comments and whether you're here to talk about this particular agenda item or another agenda item, um, it relates to, again, this one or any future agenda items. So give me your attention for a few moments if you could. So the public comment period of tonight's agenda is a time when concerned members of the community may publicly voice their concerns on the agenda item being heard by the Planning Commission. If you would like to comment this evening, please raise your hand and you will be called up to the podium. Prior to any comments, please state your full name, your address for the record. Your comment period is limited to three minutes. When the light turns red, I will ask you to stop and return to your seat. A spokesman may also speak for multiple members of the public. If a spokesperson is speaking for multiple individuals, the chairperson or that's me since I'm running the meeting tonight, the chairperson may allow the person additional time to speak within, within reason and at my discretion. Comments made during this time should be addressed to the Planning Commission only, stressing that one, Planning Commission only uh, should be receiving the comments, not the applicant and not staff, or not your comments should not be directed at other members of the public, and those comments need to pertain to matters specifically related to the, the agenda item. Please be aware that neither the Planning Commission, City staff, 
nor the applicant are expected to respond or engage in a discussion or debate during your public comment period. The Planning Commission will ask questions of the staff and of the applicant after the public comment period is over, as is deemed appropriate. Basically, there's some questions that we wouldn't ask just because they wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but for the most part, we want to try to get to the gist of what you're asking about. And so we will ask those questions to the applicant or the city staff later. The chairperson may allow all persons to speak only once until all persons have had the opportunity to speak. Please limit your comment to items that add to the discussion. If somebody else has already mentioned the point or points that you wanted to make, feel free to make, uh, feel free to still state your agreement with and or your support for the items on the record, but be respectful, be respectful of everybody's time and refrain from restating the same issues in repetition. Personal attacks and disagreements, personal or employment matters, the use of profanity or ethnic, racial, or gender-oriented slurs are prohibited, as is any disorderly conduct which violates state or local law and shall, and shall not be permitted. Once the public comment period is closed, the Planning Commission will not accept further public comments. So, does anybody have any public comments related to this particular agenda item? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period for this particular agenda item. And uh, staff, uh, not staff, um, commission, do we have any further discussion about this particular issue? Yeah, it's, it, like uh, Delphine just said, it seems pretty straightforward to me and I, I will vote in favor of it. And let me just say right now, I'm not, historically, I'm not that planning commission member that's comfortable jumping from two to five, but based on where this is, I'm more than comfortable with, with that recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Sure you're ready. The, the R5 is manufactured home. Yes, but it is. Period. So it's got it automatically what an R5 would be. You, I don't see any. I think it looks like it fits that property. It looks like a nice fit. And that, just from a staff standpoint, that's what's a little unique about our zoning. We have, you know, our, you know, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. One would assume that the higher the number, the higher the density. That's actually not the case here. The R5 just refers to the fact that it's low density manufactured is is what that allowance is there. So, and that zoning just to the south on the screen of the subject property is actually R6, which refers to medium density manufactured housing. Sounds good. So if there's no further comments, I will accept a motion if anybody has one. Well, I actually might give one comment um, about the fact that the, we've encountered cases before with the applicant wasn't here and determined that that isn't, and that's no barrier to us, you know, approving it. I will say though, <clears throat> you know, for the record and for future reference, I think particularly because there's no public comment um, that is, you know, questioning whether this is against their welfare. And um, it does seem pretty clear from our perspective, we don't have questions to ask the applicant. I'm comfortable with doing that, however. Uh, but that's uh, especially why. Yeah. Okay. Understood. So does anybody have a motion? I like a motion. Everybody make a motion. <laughs> I hereby make a motion uh, to recommend approval of the rezone request of the Vargas property to the R5 Low Density Manufactured Housing District. The request meets the code criteria based on the evidence and testimony presented at this hearing and in the staff report. Is there a second? Great. Any discussion concerning the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? So it's unanimous and it passes. Okay. Our next agenda item would be the Seasons Subdivision Rezone. Chase, William, whoever would like to take the, the floor. That'll be me. Thank you. Uh, I have a brief presentation that I'll share. Uh, just give me one second here. 
So as stated, this is a rezoning application for two pieces of the season subdivision. Uh, the subdivision overall is located on the northeast corner of Miami Road and South Hillcrest. Uh, the thick red lines here indicate a general location of the pieces of the property which the rezone request is applicable. And here is a map showing the current zoning of the property. Uh, these lines are pretty close, but I'll show a more precise map in a bit. But as you can see, the parcel to the east is actually currently split zoned. Uh, it's partially already R4 high density district and part of it is currently R3A medium high density district. Uh, when an individual parcel has more than one zoning district on it, we call that split zoning. Uh, this is generally a bad practice in the planning world. Uh, this application would rectify that so the whole property would be R4 instead of just part of it. Uh, the piece adjacent, this piece is adjacent to properties zoned R4, R3A, R2 are low density low density district, which is the cemetery, uh, P public district, and R6 medium density slash manufactured housing district. Well, uh, let me interrupt you real quick. Does anybody know how to get the blinds closed? We have a lot of folks suffering. Do we, Sharon, do we know how to cl close the blinds? Sorry, William, to interrupt. It's okay. Um, okay, go for it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going here. Uh, the other portion uh, is currently zoned B4, which is the neighborhood shopping district. Uh, this is adjacent to R4, R3A, MHR, which is the manufactured housing residential district, and some property outside of city limits. The applicant is requesting a rezone of these pieces to R4 high density district. Uh, the B4 area consists of approximately 4.92 acres, and the R3A area is about 4.31 acres. Uh, here's a more detailed map showing the areas to be rezoned. Uh, this does include a meets and bounds description, uh, and the part of the map with these stripes here is the area to be rezoned. This does also include adjacent rights of way. As previously mentioned, rezone applications shall be allowed if the amendment is not adverse to the public health, safety, and welfare, and the amendment is in conformity with the master plan, or existing zoning is erroneous, or conditions in the area have changed materially since the area was last zoned. Uh, the R4 district, uh, as proposed, is intended to provide for a variety in densities and allows multiple family residences. It is worth pointing out that multifamily residential uses are actually already allowed in the existing zoning districts. Uh, as a use by right, but this rezone would allow for more flexibility uh, and, as mentioned, rectify the split zoning issue. Uh, I'll also mention that the allowable height does not change with this application. Uh, it is a max height of 35 feet for both the existing and the proposed zoning. According to our comprehensive plan, there's a few districts in our future land use. Uh, part of this is residential mixed density medium, mixed density high, and neighborhood shopping center. Uh, these allow for a variety of residential types ranging from single family to multifamily structures, as well as townhomes, apartments, and mixed use development. Uh, looking at our land use chapters of our comprehensive plan, one goal that we do have is for infill and redevelopment. Uh, we do want to promote higher density infill and development of underutilized sites, uh, especially in areas that are accessible by foot, bike, and public transit. We also wish to encourage increased housing variety uh, that goes for both housing types and densities, as well as increased accessibility to affordable housing and encouraging a mix of housing price ranges. In conclusion, staff finds that this proposal meets the rezone criteria from Section 4429A of our Municipal Code. It's in compliance with the comprehensive plan and its uh, development and housing goals. It's compatible with existing uses in the area, and the rezone application would fix the split zoning issue. Staff recommends approval of the rezone application. Uh, and with that, uh, I believe we have uh, a, a representative of the applicant in person as well as on Zoom tonight. Um, Any initial questions for staff before we give this to the applicant? Okay, let's go ahead and have the applicant Zoom or in person who, and uh, please state your name and your address for the record. I'm Fred Ballard with Delmont Consultants, 125 Colorado Avenue uh, here in Montrose. And um, 
William did a great job presenting it, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have or add to it, but he's pretty much covered what's going on. So, so I think we have a pretty good idea of the zoning change. Can you give us a better idea of what's truly going on with the property itself? Well, of course, uh, going to ch change, uh, changing the zoning could allow a couple different things. Um, right now, they are looking at apartment buildings. Um, you know, for the workforce, um, there's a lack of housing in Montrose. And so even though the zone, current zoning actually already allows for this. And the only difference is, is you know, this just by, as William had mentioned, it gives us a little more flexibility of how that would do. And one thing I would just bring into mind for some of the neighboring parcels here, um, that before um, right now would allow those apartments to be right up to the property line, rezoning to uh, our, our request is actually going to put a, a little bit of barrier that would be required between those. So to me, I would think that they would find a little bit of comfort knowing now that they'll have to build a little bit further from the property line. Right now there's a zero foot set, set back from the property line with the current zoning on B4. So, so B4, there's going to be more setback requirement. Correct. B4 also, I'm sorry, the new, the new R4 requires more setback compared to B4. Correct. But you said there's also more flexibility in that particular section going from the B4 to R4. What's that additional flexibility? Give yeah, no, no, so it just, uh, as far as the, you know, of course, of course the density would be a little bit different on that. And then, you know, as far as just, just being able to, where the, where we'd be able to put ponds and stuff like that. So, you know, because there's, there's, there's retention required for, because there's not a real good place here for retention. They don't want us to, for some reason, Scott won't allow us just to jump, dump the water out in the creek, so. <laughs> but now going from the 3A to the um, R4 is gonna be a bit more of a dramatic change. Uh, very little, but again, it's just a little bit of flexibility. And really, if you, again, just looking at that, you can see there's split zoning on that same piece of property because that property really goes clear on over to touch the B4, the existing property does, that lot does. And so it's just that that lot is cut in half because of the way the zoning is. And so then it just makes it a little harder to say, okay, well, this much is being in this part, this much is in this part, and how do you figure out the square footage and whatever of the amount of units? So it's, it's a lot of it is a cleanup. Um, why it was ever zoned the way it is is beyond me. <laughs> so. Okay, and so you're anticipating true apartment buildings compared to right now what I would consider condos or townhouses. Correct. Um, okay. And so what's the plan between, uh, what is it, Pennsylvania and as it butts up to the, is it a lawnmower repair place with that little area? Yep. Um, so, so right now there is no really good plan. That, there's not enough room in there because what there is, there's a, a Uncompared Valley Water Users has an easement through that. And so it really doesn't leave a lot of land to do anything in there, a lot of room to develop. So. At, at this point, there would probably not be anything going in that area. There's just not feasible for anything. So. And I, I know that Chad already asked um, the difference because it seems like what you plan on doing or want to do with the property is feasible with the B4, correct? Correct, yes. And B4 does allow us to do that already. Okay, so I understand that maybe we want to clean up and match, but it does give you a whole lot more... Um, access through R4, including commercial and so on and so forth. Is that something that you're considering for the bottom floor, or is that like I, I'm just wondering why rezone if you don't need a rezone? Yep. So, so, so again, so it, right now it could already yes could have commercial in there in the B4, but we would not be doing a commercial in there. I, even I think the R4 actually still would allow that, but um, just again flexibility, just kind of being able to. Um, as far as the configuration of the buildings and stuff and the parking lots. Because I think as part of our roles, it's important that, you know, when we give that extension to R4, um, you can at any point change your mind on what you're going to put there. And once we give you that, we, when we grant that R4, that's, that expands and, f and puts a lot more flexibility in your hands, and then you can decide to do what, whatever you wish. So that's why we're trying to have a better understanding of why behind it so we know exactly what we're granted and what the plan is if that makes sense so it's hard for me personally it's a little difficult for me to say well i understand why for the back of the parcel so this is all one property 
the two lots? Um, so the, the, the area that's currently zoned R3A, uh, as well as the, uh, B4, the, the yeah. R4 to the, just to the west of it, uh, kind of the yellow and brown area, uh, that's all currently one property, but currently two different zoning districts. And so the, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Um, yes. This area outlined in red mm -hmm. uh, is actually also the same property as this area as well. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess I'm confused why we're not then enclosing everything if it's one property and we're putting those lines where they are now. So those lines are a reflection of current zoning. And so you're oh, not, I you, if you're rezoning um, part of the property, you're not rezoning the entire property. No, I see what you mean. Because that's already R4. Yeah, and that's correct. why R4 makes more sense, is because it's already there on the property, correct. even though it's split. Got it. And, and highlights Thank why you. split zoning is problematic. Because <laughs> you end up with yeah. these arbitrary boundaries in the middle of lots. And it yeah causes confusion. I so can see that. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, I understand. OK, that was very helpful. Thank you. Get a, just a quick clarification might clear up some things from the staff specifically about what the difference is between the B4. We've sort of said, okay, they can both, the R4 and the B4 can have apartment buildings. Um, the applicant cited the setbacks as one issue and the drainage ponds. Can staff speak to that and maybe clear some of those questions up as to what um, the differences would be specifically regarding the uh, multifamily dwellings on the B4 versus the R4? <coughs> Yeah, so as mentioned in B4 and R4, uh, multifamily residential uh, structures are allowed as a use by right. Uh, however, in B4, uh, those uh, density requirements are equal to, I believe it's 2,900 square feet uh, per unit. In the R4, it would be 2,300 square feet per unit. Uh, so it allows a little bit higher density uh, and a little more flexibility in terms of um, uh, how many units could go in there. Uh, of course, that is a, a maximum, not a minimum. Um, and so the, the developer can certainly uh, uh, develop in a uh, less dense fashion. And then you know, piggybacking off that, um, you know, in the B4 zone district, um, as it sits today, there's, there's a number of commercial type uses that could actually go in there. Uh, with the R4 zone district, commercial uses are, are very limited in that regard. So that's, I guess, probably one thing to keep in mind is, as it currently sits, a lot of commercial type uses could actually be developed on that site if it was rezoned to R4 for that particular portion to the west there, um, then, then those commercial type uses wouldn't be allowed. It would primarily be the residential type uses, which would be allowed by right, essentially. So Jace, what is the height? Um, how, how high can they go on a B4 versus a B, R3? It's R4, both 35 B3, feet. A, B, C, pardon me? It's bo both 35 feet. 35 so the, feet. The height does not change. Okay. Do the open space requirements change with this zoning? So uh, starting with B4 to R4? and then the uh, 3A to R4? No. Yeah, open space, when it comes to open space, those, those are looked at when a subdivision comes in or an application for the actual development. We, we look at it at that point in time, but that's not reflected in the, the zoning. Thank you. Yep. Okay, no more questions from the commission. So. Sir, you can go ahead and have a seat, and Thank we you. will open our public comment section. And so, um, ultimately, ideally, if you have you've signed the sheet back there, and it's not a requirement that you sign, but it's just very helpful to Sharon so that she has some names when she's then listening to the recording and figuring out who truly spoke. Um, so, ideally, that's that happens, but it's not required. So, who would like to speak and come on up? And as a reminder, yeah, come on up, sir. You can be first. Um, as a reminder, please identify your name, your address before any comments. And uh, then again, when, when our light turns red, please stop your comments. Thank you, sure. sir. 
I'm going to represent myself and also a group, so I'll be representing multiple. I'll be, my name is Dean McCall. I reside at 2130 Oregon Street here in Montrose, Colorado. Um, I'm also the HOA president for the current seasons with all the development that's gone in there, um, but I also reside there. And so I'll represent from both sides of that. Um, we purchased the property, the other section that's up there that you can see where the townhomes have gone in. Um, we have constructed 19 townhomes in there over the last three years. There was 11 townhomes built in there previously for us purchasing the property. The little bootleg that goes back behind and comes up on a round, that's R3A. We also still currently own as lot, out lot A. Um, my partner and I have not come back and tried to replat that and continue to build. There's a significant demand for what we're building, um, but we have switched our attention to StarCore, which I've been in front of you guys for, so we could build some other things to meet a community need. That being said, um, we looked at the property. Um, there's two story townhomes there on the left for that straight row. The other 19 that we built, we felt like it lent itself extremely well to that type of design to meet a community need and also um, aging in place, zero entry, all those other per perspectives that we put in and they all pre-sold before we even got through them. It also was really conducive to the golf course or the city golf course across the street, which we were trying to be mindful of. Um, so we knew we had R4. We knew that we could create that density. Um, I mean, I can do the simple math on it and say the rezoning comes back and you move that other section that's R3A to R4, you know, with 2,900 square feet versus 2,300 square feet, their acreage gives you probably, I mean, I don't know what 150 units on R4 if it's across the board. So if you rechange that density, you just added 25 homes or apartment, or I call it doors. So you added 25 to 30 doors by this rezoning that you do that is going to put some burden on it. Um, out lot A, we still have there. Our plans were to continue this design and meet the community need and in our plan development be able to have that. So there's about 24 more homes that would wrap around that corner that would be the townhomes. Um, so it'd be just under 60 that I'd come back to you all on for out lot A. Um, you know, if we switch that rezoning, it changes the entire footprint of what I'm going to be looking at because those townhomes that I was being able to build and sell is going to look right out the back door at probably a two-story at least. Odds are they'll come back and ask for a height restriction exception and probably go to three-story. Um, I could see them doing that. Um, either way, um, it's not who I want to be and what my vision was for what we were trying to create for the community there, but if that changes my ability to build those things, I would probably come back and ask for an R4 on those other ones. Um, so I'm just, I'm trying to be mindful and also represent the HOA, also a homeowner in there, and what we're trying to look at. But, you know, I definitely see out front where it could handle that density and it could handle that type of a volume, but you start popping probably 25 to 30 more homes in that back corner, it's going to change things. Thank you, sir. One other quick question. Pennsylvania, where it goes through, if this does get granted and, and done, the whole entire footprint is designed about making sure Pennsylvania extends through there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ma'am, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Mary Tarr. I live in Ridgeway, Colorado. I just bought, and we're completing seven units on the corners of Stanford and Oregon. I would have not bought those if I had known that they were going to change the zoning behind us. Um, I love the character of the community. It became attractive to me because it was uh, professional people, uh, uh, retired people that were, had easy access to the golf course, very quiet community. I've had uh, one three-unit filled with renters, and they're very pleased with it because of the quietness. And I worry about if we have this big R4 going on behind us in multiple units, what are we going to do with all the traffic that it creates uh, with additional people living behind us? And they will be directly behind us. 
Uh, so my concern is I don't want to change the character of the community because it's a very pleasant place for the homeowners and my tenants to live. So that is why I'm here protesting that we change the zoning. Thank you. Can you repeat, you said the corner of Stanford and what was the other street? Oregon. Oregon, thank you. Who is next? Yes, ma'am. Name and address, please. My name is Sean Wolford, 2124 Oregon Street. I just have a few questions. <clears throat> With the density that's being proposed, how are the utilities going to be handled? Sewer, water, retention ponds, detention ponds, flooding. There is the creek, which may be a river. I don't know what it's called, but it's there. Um, the traffic increase is going to be with proposed, I don't know how many homes, 80, 100 apartments. I don't think the infrastructure in that corner, there is no way that can be handled. Pennsylvania is a two-way street. Uh, there's nowhere to go. They can't make it four-lane. They couldn't even do a three. Um, and the, as Mary said, the quietness of our neighborhood is what brought the majority of the homeowners to that neighborhood. I mean, we were going to accept some new buildings that Dean had proposed following our floor plan, which would make the community lovely. Um, also, fire and uh, police access protection with that many residents or, or tenants, whatever, going in, how is the city going to handle um, all of that? Um, the way our subdivision is set up behind the current homes on Oregon facing this property these re are residents in seasons. We're going to be looking out our fence to a three-story building. It, it is going to change the whole concept of our subdivision. Um, and you said these are going to be affordable apartments. What does affordable apartment mean? Are these going to be low-income apartments? Are they going to be HUD apartments or what? Um, those are some of our concerns, or my concern, I should say. So definitely, I am not in favor of these apartments going in there. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Who is next? Yes, ma'am. I'm Andrea Chadwell. I live at 428 Stanford Lane. My townhouse backs up to the pink area and the back side would face that. Um, my question is, and I pretty much know the reasoning behind it, but if there's a split um, district here, why don't, and since we are already 3A, or 3A, why aren't we changing it all to just three R3A? Because that would maintain the type of structures that can be built similar to ours. It would still allow for some density, but not density that would lower our values for our homes. Also maintain some privacy for our homes and be a more, um, uh, something more acceptable for that area. I do understand that developers usually like high density because you can make a lot more money that way. Um, but I did move here for the same reasons and I support all things that have been said previously. And I am against this if it's going to go to R4. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir.
My name is Ray Lalone. Our family is at 523 Stanford Lane. We moved to Montrose three years ago from the Front Range, as a lot of people are doing. And we moved into the Seasons area because we did like the way it looked, the way it felt, the density, uh, the number of houses that were there. And frankly, when we moved in, we were told there was going to be a shopping center or some kind of shopping area. Uh, where I believe the B4 area is now. And that sounded good to us also. Um, taking, if you look at that plot out there and you visualize, how can that support a, an, an unknown number of apartments? And frankly, that's one of my problems. We don't really know what the plan is. We don't know what they're gonna build. Are they gonna build two-story units, three-story units? How many are they gonna be? Are they gonna be HUD housing? What is the plan? And I don't know that this is the correct forum for that kind of decision, but I do think that it's a very important part of the decision-making process when you look at this type of a very significant change in, uh, in zoning. That's all I've got, thank you. Thank you, sir. Who is next? Okay, we'll go with the gentleman up front and then in, in the back, next. My name's Jerry Heibigner. I live at 427 Stanford, Montrose. Go ahead, sir. Well, it's been brought up in a couple times, but here's, here's my main concern. These buildings are gonna be built up through Pennsylvania. That's where all, most of the part of the work and whatever they're gonna build. The other being in front of us, in front on, off of stand, uh, Hillcrest in Miami. He, here's my th problem. If they put all of those places along Pennsylvania or the ones in front off of uh, Hillcrest, the, the buildings that are gonna be off of uh, Hillcrest, the only entrance and exit for those buildings, whatever they put there, is going to have to go on Pennsylvania. The cars from, go, once they get there, they're, they're going to have to turn left to go down to Hillcrest or go about a half a block to get to uh, Stanford. If you put that many more houses all the way up on the other end of the, the lots, that many, say, say they built something that has 200, 100 units. That, if you look at that realistic, you can, you, each person could have two cars. So you're looking at 200 cars for one unit. Now 200 cars in this area, where, where there's Pennsylvania, it's a two lane road, or Stanford, either one, if they, to fund one thing, Stanford will be ruined. It's a nice quiet street right now, but it's a street that goes from Pennsylvania to Miami. So, and, I think that street will be used more than Pennsylvania because it goes down to Hillcrest. Hillcrest is such, since they put that roundabout in, it's such a busy street. These cars go through that roundabout and they go 35 miles an hour down. Hillcrest, well, I've gone down, I've sat there forever. Tried, you can't turn right or left, there's so many cars there. So the majority of these cars, my feeling is, is they're gonna take uh, Stanford down to Miami. And Miami is just as busy, truthfully. But that's just too much traffic to have in this small of an area. The, the, the houses, the townhouses that we have there now, we can, we can handle those streets. But you, if you put places that you can, you're going to have two or 300 cars, it's going to be a traffic jam that you couldn't imagine. And it's, it's going to affect everybody. That's my biggest thing. And I think it, not only that, like they were talking about the fire and police coming, they got they they go in one way, they got to come out the same way. It, for Pennsylvania, there's not going to be any side streets farther up uh, east, so it's one street in, one street out, and that's basically all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Scott. Can you start doing some math? Because you seem to be always be our math person. So the R3A area. Can you start calculating what will the density change associated with the number of units in a rough ballpark figure? 
I've, I've got that already. Oh, Will, okay, you're prepared. Thank yep. you, sir. Um, hold on and we'll actually get those numbers in just a bit, but um, it's great that you already know those numbers. Yes, ma'am, name and address, please. Hi, my name is Laura DeVore. I live at 416 Stanford Lane, so right next to the pink area as well. Um, I was born and raised in Montrose. I love this community. And I moved back here three years ago and felt so lucky to find a home. And I love living in a townhouse. I love our current community. The density is great. Um, I, I love my neighbors. And I think the character that's already there is wonderful. I totally agree that we need more housing in this community. And there's plenty of opportunity already to have that with the current zoning. I was also under the impression that the lot in front of me would be commercial. And I wasn't under the impression that there would be an apartment building overlooking my backyard. Um, I, th I think those are the main things. Um, we've already really struggled with having this neighbor. Um, their property has not currently been maintained and I oftentimes have a lot of prairie dogs that sneak out and come into my yard that have been complained about numerous times and the property owner currently hasn't done anything about that. Um, we were also served papers about two and a half years ago about some sort of title discrepancy that I think should have been taken care of with the title company versus getting lawyers involved. Um, eventually the land title took care of that at least with my specific instance but we were all named in the suit. Um, and I think that's it. I just appreciate you taking the time to listen to all of us today and help us maintain our community that we love so much. Thank you. Actually, if you can stick around, I have a general question. Why do you find the apartments worse than a commercial environment? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it was just more about the expectations um, when I purchased the property. I think there can be some appeal to having some commercial nearby, especially if there was like a restaurant or some other sort of food opportunity, something that's walkable to where we currently live. I think that kind of live, work, play kind of thing all fits quite nicely. Um, also, it just, with the, the size of the lot, it didn't really seem like it was going to be a certain number of floors, um, but I'm this is all new to me as far as zoning goes. Uh, so I guess what I envisioned to be in that place would be much more harmonious with the community that already exists. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Good evening, name and address please. Jen. <laughs> Julia Seglin. Um, 2129 Oregon Street. So I live in between those two pieces. And um, I wrote something real As a longtime resident and realtor in this area, we think this is not only a good place to rezone, not a good place, this is a unique small area for to high density. Has any of you guys been out to this little pieces? walked them, there's there, um, it is surrounded by Cedar Creek Cemetery, and then the Cedar Creek runs through it. I was wondering if there's ever been, if you did high density, if you do an environmental report on what's gonna happen with Cedar Creek. It has, you know, a great wildlife area, and um, migratory birds come through there. I mean, it's just, it's just a unique spot. And I think that's why we all care about it so much, because we all walk around there a lot. Um, so I think this niche of small pieces of land would better serve as what Montrose really needs is more housing, yes, but not dense housing. I have a list 20 miles long of buyers that want kind of what we have already. So. Um, I don't know if we can do higher density somewhere else, not in this. I would, don't really want you to rezone this piece. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, sir in the blue shirt. Good evening, my name is Dustin Orth. 
Uh, I live at 8233-6150 Road. Um, actually, my mother-in-law lives in the neighborhood. A um, couple questions. Um, if somebody builds a two or three story apartment building right behind a lot of single level townhomes, uh, a lot of people in those townhomes are now gonna become a little nervous of everybody looking down into their yards um, from a security point. Uh, the traffic density, I think if you put in even 50 or 60 apartments in that front unit, um, the traffic density will become not a problem. I think it'll be dangerous uh, because a lot of the people that are in this community are older. They have, they walk down the street with their dogs or whatever. And if you get certain people, they don't pay attention when they drive. And we could have pedestrian versus car injuries or even worse. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Who is next? Any other folks wanting to make a comment? Oh, yes, ma'am. I've already been there once. Oh, then, then we're going to say no at this point. Anybody else who would like to make a comment? So once I close the public comment session, we are done with public comments. Okay, yes, ma'am. My name is Tanya Beckstrand. I live at 2118 Oregon Street. And I would just like to say, I think that there's a whole lot of people back there that are not saying anything, but we agree. We do not want that high density buildings going on in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, last call, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my name is Alani Heimbigner. I live at 427 Stanford. And I just want to emphasize what everybody else has said. This is a really a nice community. If we'd had any idea that this nonsense was going to take place, we would have never bought there. Because if you put in these apartments, it's going to affect our property value to the negative. And I'm not a bit happy about that at my age. That's not what we bought there for. That's not what the community was presented to us as. And we love our neighbors. Everybody gets along fabulous. And you start putting in all of this other stuff that ruins property, it's going to change the dynamics. Unbelievable. And that's all I have to say, because I'm very opposed to it, as I know a lot of people are. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? OK, we're going to officially close the public uh, comment period. and. So, questions that we have for staff initially. I have a couple of things I want to mention. <clears throat> I want to start with affordable housing. That's not what we mentioned. That's not what I heard. So I wanted to come from that with staff. What we talked about is more workforce housing, is the desire to build the apartments buildings. So I wanted to clarify that. Correct? From a, from a staff standpoint, we haven't seen any application for multifamily development okay. yet, and we don't distinguish necessarily between the, the two. Uh, we look at supportive housing differently. That has a completely definition, different definition, but if we're looking at multifamily, we don't distinguish necessarily between market rate and um, you know a tax credit uh, type facility, and we haven't seen any application from the developer at this point in time. Great. Then I wanted to also clarify for the public that when it comes to police access, fire access, utilities access, all of those access have been thoroughly looked into by staff and I'm assuming are safe at this time. So a lot of that's managed by our department. So at zoning, there's no proposal yet. So it's when site development or subdivision comes, all of the traffic reports, utility reports, fire access, police access, everything is, is reviewed and made sure, and they aren't allowed to bill if it's not compliant. Okay, and I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Next question. As we're looking at these two parcels, if we, as we know that apartments, you know, no matter how um, unhappy other people may, might be about it, are already allowed in B4, um, 
we cannot like approve it for this pink parcel and not approve it for the yellow or can we uh, I, in, in theory, I think you could make a recommendation to that effect. Um, again, it, it would be a recommendation to city council that you make, and if you were to go that route, you would essentially be, um, I guess, denying or, or not recommending a portion of the rezone. This is where I'd probably defer to our legal department. Um, And it, I guess in theory as well, if, if that was the route planning commission were to take, um, the applicant could um, essentially reapply um, with, with, with that as, as the application. Um, that doesn't mean that they are required to. Again, it's a recommendation to city council right. that you all are providing this evening. <clears throat> it's not a final decision. So if, if you make a recommendation to deny um, that could still go to City Council as the requested zone this evening for the entirety of the, the property. Thank you for that reminder. Um, the reason for clarity that I'm asking is because there is a big difference between approving, in my opinion, one parcel or the other and putting them together makes it a little bit challenging for me per, um, personally to be able to make a decision that um, fits both parcels. Um, next. Can we clarify something, can I just jump in and clarify something real quick? Um, and I might be wrong, but the other, what we're calling the other parcel, the yellow parcel uh, outlined in red on the map, that's currently zoned R3A, correct? And multifamily and a, a 30 story apartment building is also a use by right in that. Is that correct? Yes, multifamily is yeah. allowed as a use by right so already. Right now. Uh, 35 foot height maximum. And it, does that have the same density for that building as the B4 does? Yes. Yeah, so they're, they're equivalent zoning for multifamily now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. I hope this helps you guys as well to know. Um, and then I think I had one more. Oh, no. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, Scott or Jace, whoever wants to speak up. Do the environmental regulations change associated with one zoning compared to the next. And so specifically talking about the creek and its impact in, onto the creek. So all that's evaluated with a proposal. So if, if someone come in for an apart, comes in for an apartment building or a subdivision on any of these parcels, those are evaluated at that time. They're the same regardless of the zoning. Those regulations don't change depending on the zone. Um, they look at the, the project and its merits and what its impacts are. Um, so. Obviously, some, a bigger project would have different impacts than a small project kind of thing. Um, and that's all <coughs> reviewed with that, um, with either subdivision or site development, depending on the project. Um, environmentally, so the biggest thing we, or the biggest regulation um, that ties that is, is water quality. So all of the stormwater has to be modern. Um, our uh, discharge permit requirements with the state through our MS4 um, for water quality and water quantity. Um, to prevent flooding um, and also treat and silt our sediment out or settle out the sediments um, um, from you know the urban stormwater that comes off of developed areas. Um, so that's the biggest kind of piece that's regulated. Um, the rest are uh, just general subdivision codes that talk about you know compatibility and not um, you know excessively damaging to um, uh, you know environmental areas. Which within an urban setting, there's there's, we have, you know, like critical yellow billed cuckoo habitat that are designated by the feds, or if there is a known like endangered species, those are really the only major triggers there. Um, you know, like it doesn't take into account that a deer passes through there or something like that. Um, Cause that's pretty typical impact within an urban setting. Thank you. I can tell you've got another question. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm a big fan that when something like this happened to come in with solutions, and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure who it was who made the suggestion that why can't we make the seasons R3A so that it matches with the yellow, right? Um, and I know we're not allowed to discuss outside of our project, so we have to focus on, on our two parcels and we can't discuss that. I just do want to state that if we want those lot lines to be kind of in line and everything matching, that might be something amazing to do for that area 
Um, I just really like to think outside the box sometimes and see what our possibilities are. So although it's tough because I know we can't speak about other parcels when we speak about one specific project, but is this something realistically, legally, and on the city the staff level, is this something we could consider? Well, we have to look back at what the applicant is requesting here. This isn't a staff request. Uh, it, it's an applicant request to, to rezone it to R4 and rezone just those sections that are outlined in red there on the screen. So I understand where, where you're coming from in terms of, well, that other portion of the property is currently zoned R4. Could it be reverted back to R3? That's a request that the applicant or the property owner would actually have to make. That's not something that we would initiate or, or enforce. So yeah, okay. and another thing, just to, from a, from a use standpoint, so R three A, as we've indicated tonight, it allow, allows multifamily, it allows townhome development, it allows single family. R four allows those same types of uses. So at, we haven't seen a, a proposal come in yet. In theory, it could be the same type of development. In theory, it might not be, but that's the same as if it stays the current zoning as well. I would I, I would say. So. And just for public information. May I share that even if this doesn't pass, it doesn't mean apartments are not going to happen because R3A allows multifamily. That would, that would be a fair assessment. Okay, thank you. So That's we'll correct. Let's, get, yeah, well, let's get to some of your numbers. Uh, what, what does the density change? So um, this is a rough estimate, so it would require a, a survey to give an exact answer, but it should be accurate within uh, probably one or two units. Um, so the property, the, the northeast property here that's currently split zoned, uh, currently as it's, as it's zoned, uh, that property would allow approximately 93 apartment units. Um, that would be a use by right uh, with the existing zoning. With the rezone, uh, that would allow 118. So it would allow 18 additional units. Um, uh, the northeast corner of the roundabout, uh, as it currently stands, would allow 61 units and uh, with the proposed rezone it would allow 74. So talking, about, talking about that, um, I think Scott that's a question for you. As we don't know what they're going to submit and what kind of plan they have and we're just focusing on zoning today. Um, this zoning does not account for parking, correct? Or does it? Parking's handled with site development. So when they, right. so if they were to come late. in for an apartment proposal, okay. um, they would be required, I think as the code currently sits, one and a half parking spaces per unit. A lot of times they do more um, just for marketability. Um, and uh, that would be enforced with, regardless of zoning, um, that would be enforced the same. Okay. Thank you. And it would be required on site. They can't use the street for that. In terms of how how those apartments are constructed, which we don't even know if they're going to be apartments, in terms of whether they're facing the street or going facing the current units, we don't know that at all until we get the next plan. We really are kind of ahead of ourselves in terms of just exactly what this is going to look like until he comes back with the plan. At that point, there may be an opportunity to respond to actually the physical setup. But my question is, about the, the roads, the egress, and that kind of thing. Has that been looked into at this at this level yet? So again, at, at zoning, um, we don't have a proposal in front of us. Um, I can speak generally what we would like to see there. Um, and that gentleman who spoke about, you know, those that are looking to go south on Hillcrest, they would go back, go over to uh, Stratford, um, and hang a right on Miami because that is lower volume. But um, you know, Pence, this subdivision was built and has always been envisioned. Its two access points would be Pennsylvania and Stratford. So. Um, any continued development of this would access those local roads. Um, they do have the capacity to handle either one of those densities. Um, uh, they're, you know, they're built to a city standard and, and wide enough to handle that volume. Um, the intersection, so the challenge becomes at Hillcrest, you know, especially a left turn, especially during peak hour um, onto Hillcrest, but the remedy to that is going down um, Stratford hanging a right and then using the roundabout to get where you wanted to go. Um, so with that investment at the roundabout, that's, that is improved. Um, and I think the Dean's point too about the connection, um, so that's something, you know, when they were doing their due diligence on this property, we indicated that because that was originally laid out to loop that we would ask to see that maintained because the viability of that southeastern lot relies on 
the connectivity through those two. So um, that is something we have communicated to them. But again, we haven't seen any application or proposal, so you know it's all speculative at this point. One more question. This doesn't affect that waterway, does it? If, Isn't there a waterway through there? So um, Cedar Creek runs through there, yeah, right along the north it side. It doesn't affect that at all. Well, Obviously. development, so what do you define effect? Maybe better, an open-ended question. How would this <laughs> impact Cedar Creek? What's that? How would this impact Cedar Creek, this development? So Cedar Creek, I mean, as far as environmental, so again, we have the environmental regulations on the storm waters for impacting water quality of Cedar Creek. The creek itself, um, it has a FEMA, FEMA mapped regulatory floodway and floodplain. So those would all regulate how close you can get to the creek and then the flooding um, implications. And again, the water would be attenuated for flooding purposes as well to make sure you're not contributing excess flow above pre-development levels that would you know, exacerbate flooding downstream or anything like that. So that's how Dry Cedar Creek is controlled from a regulation standpoint. And that's what controls what you can do. Practically speaking, there's a limit on how close you can get to um, uh, Cedar Creek because those bank it's a natural system. You don't want to get too close. Those banks naturally um, retreat over time and move. And so developers will, you know, that, that's, that's on them. So they would have to set their, um, any infrastructure they put in, set it far enough back so that okay. they won't be threatened by the, by the creek. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hope that. Yeah, hope that answers your question. <laughs> Jan, Jan pretty much asked my question but, uh, about the traffic because they're really concerned about the traffic. And you answered a lot of that, but will there be a traffic study whenever you get the plans? Does that go along with it anyways? So Absolutely. Yep. So, yep. so, so this I mean, will be more in detail when you, oh, when you actually know what's going to happen. Try, I'm trying to get closer to the mic and my chair is not allowing me. Um, yeah, so any, in our code, any development that produces over 250 trips per day, um, which, you know, a, a multifamily development here would, um, triggers a full bone traffic impact study. And that's when they look at, um, capacities of the arterials on you know both sides feeding it capacities of the intersections um, delays uh, wait times at the intersections the necess necessitation for um, dedicated right turn lanes acceleration lanes things of that sort yep. and what I'm hearing you say or from my experience I'm just trying to provide some information for the group when you're doing those traffic studies if it's going to turn the what happens with the traffic study is we get there's a rating of A, B, C of quality of traffic. Of, and C is obviously is much heavier, ugly traffic, which implies that you have to wait for an extended period of time to turn right or left, et cetera. And so if it does turn into a C level quality, for example, does that imply that we the city never recommends or approves that development if it does degrade to a certain level? Uh, it can, yeah. So it's ultimately so, so for all intersections and street capacity, streets have established criteria for the volume that they can handle. Um, the intersections um, have established criteria for the volumes they can handle, and you can model the associated delay that comes with, you know, a given side volume traffic against a certain through traffic which has certain gaps and things of that sort. So all of that's quantified, and then those data are used to make the decisions on is this an acceptable development so the two kind of big triggers on that one is there is you know industry accepted standards of delay and those you know vary kind of by community um, you know people in Denver are far more used to delay than you know a community like Montrose um, and so there's kind of decisions to be made on what is the acceptable level of delay um, we typically go to industry standards on that as a city um, and then uh, then there's the overwhelming like so you know if it's it's going to have more delay. Obviously, any product will have more delay. But is it within the acceptable range? If it is yes, then you know that's we we would probably get sued if we didn't approve that um, because it is within industry standards. <clears throat> the kind of more extreme version of that is you know something comes back and there's a it's you know very obvious unacceptable level of delay, something that would cause gridlock um, or it would create a situation that would severely compromise safety. That's where it's easy for us to say. No, that can't be improved until this is remedied, um, and uh, because you know it's our job to protect the public safety and welfare. So, um, you know, in those cases where it comes back glaringly, um, uh, very high delay, uh, those are very easy to say that you can't move forward until that's fixed. Um, 
at times the development will fix it. Others, you know, like so, like the Miami Hillcrest extent or the Miami Hillcrest roundabout, for example. Um, you know, without if that wasn't done, that would definitely have hindered development in this area, um, and because uh, it was a known safety issue to begin with. Um, but you know, they patiently waited until the city built that. We built that as a arterial pro or as a city capital um, construction project, which was needed, regardless of what goes on in this corner of the world. Um, it was something that you know benefits 10,000 residents a day or 10,000 vehicles a day, um, and so you know sometimes the city's already working on it through their capital projects anyway, and in those cases, um, you know, there just helps helps us with our capital prioritization of what's going on elsewhere. Um, that being said, I wouldn't anticipate any major improvements being needed here, um, given, you know, Miami long range is to be widened to an arterial standard as a city project, which would have um, same template of like kind of the South Hill Crest extension where you'd have curb better sidewalk, bike lanes, through lanes, center turn lanes, and, and uh, rec paths. Um, so Miami is on the city's long-term um, capital planning or capital plan. Um, Hillcrest is is pretty decent for a while, um, with the roundabouts completed. We're working on uh, Hi Niagara and Hillcrest roundabout right now. Um, that'll probably start next year. Um, but uh, you know, there's been a lot of investment in the Hillcrest corridor. It's it's got a lot of volume on it, um, but it does have some room to spare right now. So I wouldn't expect any major improvements to be needed by, regardless of the zoning. Um, uh, in this area outside of obviously the infrastructure and utilities that the development itself would build. Sounds good. And so based upon the numbers that Will gave us, we're looking at roughly if the zoning was changed and thus the density was increased, we're looking at roughly 38 additional units increased compared to what could already be built based upon uh, land use rights. Yes, used by rights. Thank you. That's the proper term. So Scott is 38 car or 38 units maybe turning into two cars per family, et cetera. Does that dramatically change the typical delays when in, in the morning traffic when people are coming and going? I think both would add, um, obviously add, add traffic and delay. I don't think just at this cut without seeing a traffic report, you know, that would put anything over a tipping point. But again, the traffic study is the one that is the ultimate decision factor on that that would come with the project. Gotcha. Thank you. So let, let me just, in, in my own mind, conclusion, let's, let me just kind of wrap this up for me, not for you guys, because we can go on till <laughs> what, 11 o'clock. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, so something's going to happen. Something could happen. I mean, it's not like we can, we can stop any building at all. I mean, something will happen at that place, at that corner. Um, Traffic is going to be a nightmare because of developments that are going on past that, like out Miami. I mean, that may or may not have happened, but eventually that's going to happen. So that's an issue. I, I hear everything you say, and I tell you what, it, it's a bad aftertaste to say this. Um, so hypothetically, they build, and we don't know what it looks like. You know, they may decide to keep it at B4 and put in a some commercial building. I mean, we don't know, so we can only speculate what could happen. So if they put in a planned development, we have the right to put conditional uses on that as far as height restriction, right? Because I, I hear what they're saying that some of those that would butt right up against it, they don't want a third story, two story looking right down in their backyard. So we have that option, not tonight, because we don't know what's going to happen, but we do have that option going forward at the next step, correct? We can put conditional uses based on what they propose, correct? Um, so if the applicant did come back with a planned development, which is not a guarantee that they would, uh, however, if they did, um, the Planning Commission could request conditions being uh, to be placed on that plan development. Uh, I believe that would, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, legal, I believe that would have to be uh, with the, um, you'd have to ask the applicant uh, if those conditions were acceptable. Uh, but the uh, pl plan development is uh, approved or denied at the discretion of the, the uh, Planning Commission and City Council. So the plan development is, um, in theory, uh, horse trading. It 
it's give and take between the applicant and the city to um, achieve a more flexible use of the space. Hope that's helpful. But yeah, piggy, piggybacking off of, of both those comments and well said, um, you know, a use by right doesn't have to go through a plan development process. Um, and um, so it, it could be that a development, if a de development were to come in today on that, that B4 zoned area, it wouldn't need to go through a PD necessarily unless they provided for a development that required a PD. If it needed deviations from setbacks or, or other, other things, um, that's when that PD would be at play essentially. Sorry. Well, you just said setback, so it reminded me that currently there is no setback, and with the R4, there would be setback. Is that correct? So, uh, yes, within, uh, within B4, uh, for commercial uses, there are, in theory, no setbacks. Uh, we usually don't recommend that, but uh, for a commercial use in B4, there are, in theory, uh, no setbacks. For a residential use, if it is in B4, there are required setbacks. Okay. Um, but a, a, uh, for example, a store, uh, if that were to be developed, could be, could have zero foot setbacks. Okay. Thanks. For the side and <clears throat> rear, I should say. Thank you. And then the last question, and I might be putting you on the spot a little bit, um, but for me, with what I've seen and heard tonight, I'm not quite sure I understand the purpose of R4, honestly because whether it's the purpose of the applicant or maybe the applicant just didn't do a really good job to tell me why they really want R4 because of their plans currently. So I'm wondering as a staff perspective, you, I know that we look at the whole plan and what Montrose needs, but we're just talking about the about a variance of 38 units. Why leaning towards R4? Um, because I don't at this time see why that is either required or what that would do as I look at the public overall, um, why would that be a, a, a better thing for the city of Montrose and the citizen of Montrose? Again, I just struggle a little bit seeing why lean towards that. Yeah, well, in, in circling back, the, you know, the city's not the applicant for the proposal. The right. developer is in, the, in this case. And, and generally you, speaking, you, when, you, when you look at higher density zones, it provides for more flexibility, right? It provides for a, a potentially denser development. Now, whether it will be denser or not, we, we can't say right now. So a lot of that is speculation. Um, so it, it would probably be more a question for the applicant and the applicant right. team this evening. Um, but from the city's standpoint, and, and William's got it up on the screen here, um, we do believe that uh, it, it does meet several of, of our comprehensive plan criteria as to, you know, we are really looking for infill. This is a, a site that is close to uh, core services, quite frankly, um, and in higher density um, from the comprehensive plans, look at it, uh, it, it certainly supports that, that concept. So I think from a staff standpoint, we can support it certainly in that regard based on the comprehensive plan. Um, from how it better helps the applicant, I can't directly speak to that. I just have real quick, 34 feet in height. That's three stories, correct? 35 feet 30, in height. 35 feet? 35, correct. Uh, that's three stories. I think it's possible to be three stories. It might require a flat roof, or it could do two stories and a nice peaked roof. We just don't know. Okay. It's all going to depend upon how they design it. Yeah, it could be either one is the simple answer. Steve, are you ready with your question? Uh, Otherwise, I've got a question. Yeah, I, I can, go okay. yeah, yeah. can we have our applicant come back up? So you clearly have the opportunity to choose uh, your in your request whatever zoning that you're ultimately requesting. Why yes, not 3A <coughs> for the whole property? Why would does that not satisfy you? Well, R4 would, uh, if you look, look back at the zoning map, definitely fits because uh, a lot of the neighbors here, their property is already zoned R4. 
then we would be wrapping around to R4 with an R3A. Why not match what the property is already there? Okay, so we have R3A to the south, so it still is congruent. But but where R4 is in the middle between the two par okay. parcels that we're asking for on deal. And again, it just gives us a little bit more flexibility with that density if needed. Good enough. Okay. Last chance. Yeah. Any more questions for the applicant? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Okay, any more conversation with us and or questions to staff and or a motion if there's no more conversation? Oh yeah, we can absolutely turn on your mic. I don't think this involves staff at this point. I think, I think, I think this is a dilemma we have going to be facing quite a bit, frankly. We're looking at, you know, we're looking at workforce housing. We're looking at, if I should put it this way, kind of the underbelly of Montrose in, ter in terms of needed housing. This is a small, this is kind of a small, it's not a big urban uh, kind of renewal sort of thing. It's, it's appropriately placed. Uh, I'm sure people don't agree with me, and that's, I hear that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, I think, concern expressed, and I'm talking to us about us. We're going to be put in, we're going to be put in this position, ongoing. This is what's coming in front of us because uh, there are people out there that need lower income housing, workforce housing, as we call it. There's people in need of housing that are on the streets that may come up at some point. You know, I think we are in a tough position of having to look at a real, like the uh, comprehensive plan says, uh, a, a real need to take care of the people that are, are not as, that need this kind of housing and it's gonna be, we're gonna be in a tough position. We have to be, we have to step up ethically and morally in some ways that are, that may be tough for us to swallow and tough for other people around us to swallow. So I think we just need to know that as a group. And, and real, realistically, last week, or not last week, two weeks ago, last meeting, there was two changes of zoning, increasing the density. Um, both of those were approved, or the recommendation to the city council was uh, given to approve them. Um, and they were infill that was very, very similar to this situation. Um, there's, for good or for bad, a lot of houses that are gonna be built down Miami the single family houses. And so there's, in general, there's gonna be a lot of additional density on those roads. And that's where Scott's talking about long-term, Miami's gonna be built out to be able to accommodate a lot more additional traffic and all those houses that are coming from the east and potentially more apartments or townhouses here in this lot. So the traffic is coming no matter what happens. But anyway, any other conversation? The traffic and the people. And that be, yes. People are going to keep coming. So um, I, you're right. We did increase those two places, but I don't see this place being similar to what we increased two weeks ago, the last meeting. I mean, that was out locust, way out, almost way out in the country, so that seemed to handle it. This, to me, is right there, and the possibility of putting a bunch of three-story apartments right there doesn't doesn't fit with me. I mean, I know there's I, use by right. I get it. There's going to be. They could still do that, but um, I, th I think they're quite different than what we approved two weeks ago. I do think if we need to refocus on our purpose today, <clears throat> and that really our focus today is to see if the R four is the right fit, and and we heard everything tonight that you don't want this to have apartment buildings, but that decision is not gonna change that. I just wanna be clear on that, is that unfortunately, even if we see, so we're, we're talking about a variation of 38 units, that's really what we need to focus on, is to see as we look at the environment, and, and I understand that the choice at the time, even if you guys are R4 and have not you know, take full advantage of R4. Um, at this time, our focus needs to be um, 
does it make sense to move it to R4? And what we've heard tonight and what we've seen in the report, does that prevent us to go to R4? And should we advise council to, to move forward or not? And, and we are not making any decisions on three stories, two story or height. It, it, that doesn't change with this zoning change. Um, so we're not impacting the neighborhood the way we wish we could. Am I correct? I'll just yeah, it's just a recommendation it's just, today. Yes. The yes. Two, when we, we, it's a recommendation, but that also our, when you talk about, when Delphine talks about you know, making a decision about what we think, that's not just our sort of arbitrary decision, that's dictated by the code and the city law about how we make that decision, which is based on, correct me if I'm wrong, staff here in my, <coughs> my you know, giving this, but based on um, whether it impacts the health, safety, and well-being, whether there's a tangible impact in that, and then whether it's in conformity with the comprehensive master code and comprehensive plan. And, and people can request whatever zoning when they own the property, they have a right to go to the city and request whatever zoning they want in that. And that's what the city is saying, where they're not the applicant. And so, and then we're circumscribed by that law about how to make a decision about this. And so it's really our decision concretely is not, you know, what, um, you know, what we would prefer, or even ethically in some ways, it's, it's, the decision is whether it satisfies, you know, what's, um, what's in the code. And that's on the one hand, whether it meets the comprehensive plan. And I think the city, in my opinion, uh, has laid out a case and we went through the slide there where it does meet a lot of objectives in the master plan about providing variety of, of housing options. Uh, and particularly workforce housing. So, um, <clears throat> and then the other question though is this welfare question. And I do think we have a room full of people that have said that it is going to um, impact your welfare and you've given us some ways, concrete ways in which it will. And we've tried to funnel that to the city to say, you know, what's the city's process um, for ensuring that this zoning does meet that um, criteria and they have given us some responses including traffic codes and environmental um, <coughs> regulations. Um, and so, you know, we only have, you know, two options. One is to vote, vote it down, in which case the applicant does have the right to immediately start to build this three-story apartment buildings on both of those parcels of land whenever they want. And the difference would be is that those and forgive me if I'm repeating what everyone already gathered from the meeting, it, we've been in an hour, but the only difference will be that those will have a total of about, you know, 30, 35 or so, 30 less total units between the two parcels. And so it's just a question of whether, in my mind, the additional 30 units or not makes a substantial impact um, either in, in, in some applicability of the code, either in whether it meets the master code or not, or whether that additional density makes a tangible impact in the health and welfare um, condition. So just to, that's my summary of where we are. Can I ask a question of the group? Come on up to Mike. Can I ask a question of our group? Yes. What are, what are our choices tonight to vote on? I want to be very clear. Are we just voting to approve or deny an R4, period? Okay. Thank you. Right. So, so to, to go along with Steve's comments, really we're looking at based upon what they can already do, use by right, in uh, 3A, in the current zoning, foot B4, or with this additional 30-something units, does it truly put the health and safety of the area at risk? Because that's one of the major criteria for us, yeah. is the health and safety. Does it put it, the additional, those, those, the, the community at risk with those additional 30-something units? And the additional cars that come along with 30 units, and yeah, so that's the question for us. Yeah. And to, to, be, to be blunt, our, our, our plan ultimately says that there should be dense housing in areas that have a lot of services. And this is an area that does, to me, feel like it's got a lot of services. It is very close to um, some schools. It's very close to some doctor's offices down the street. It's very close to businesses on, um, on Main Street. There's a lot of services in the area, so denser housing, even if it's only 30-something units, does seem appropriate when <clears throat> it's so close to the, all those additional services. Density is already there. 
So I just, I'm wondering, so our decision is, are we, do we want to move forward with R4 or do we just deny it or take no action today because we, I haven't seen enough today to tell me that it's required. I feel like with this zoning currently in place, we already have the density, we already have the option to have more housing in Montrose, we already are gonna have the increase of traffic. We have explored a lot of things today that they already have the right to do. So I'm, I'm just not sure I've seen enough um, evidence that we really need. The, the difference is just so subtle. I just, I'm struggling a little bit to see why it's needed. I just, I don't see, no, because I always have an, a, a really clear idea when you guys are done with your presentation every time. You guys do such a great job, an amazing job always presenting it to us. Um, but on this one, I just, so that's just me personally tonight. <laughs> I don't like the increase in density. It's not much, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So. Okay. Join us on the microphone if you're going to make comments. Sorry. Is that okay? That's okay. Okay. Any other comments from the group? Does the applicant have any final statement that he wants to make? You don't have to. I, you don't have to. And city staff. Uh, no further comment from staff. Good enough. So if there's a motion or, I mean, yes, there's got to be some sort of motion. <clears throat> Okay, then I'll go. I hereby make a motion to take no action on the request. The request does not meet the code criteria based on the evidence and testimony presented in this hearing and in the staff report. Okay, yeah, uh, that's, that's not what we're, we need to do. You can deny it or you can approve it or you can continue the hearing if you need more information. But we can't just say, oh, well, well that's we're not the, gonna do That's what it says here. I'm reading off of the report to denial this is what I read straight from your thing or I didn't hear that and I'm sorry if I if I it says I hereby make a motion to take no action on the request I'm just reading it out off of your <laughs> that's a sorry. typographical that's error a not an appropriate motion I'm sorry guys uh, you'd be denying the request I assume yes okay that would be your motion okay Sorry, I read it straight through. That is, that is an apology. <laughs> so I denial the request. Your motion is to deny that's my the request. De that's my motion, if anyone wants to follow. And I'll second that. So Thank you. motion is to deny the request. Okay. That you want it written? Yes. And Sharon, I yes. seconded that motion. You bet. In conversation between the group, I'll be blunt. I don't see that the 38, 30 something additional houses is in a major impact. Um, and so when we vote, I'll ultimately be voting no to not accept that motion okay. because I'm comfortable with those additional 30 something units. Uh, the, the housing can be three stories now, it can be three stories in the future with these changes. And that is, I wouldn't want to live next to three stories either, but that's not changing. Um, the, the height requirements are not changing with this. It's just a matter of a few more units. And it makes sense based upon our comprehensive plan to create some additional housing where appropriate. And I find this very appropriate. I mean, um, I'm struggling you didn't, you did not, you, what about the trucks? <laughs> <laughs> the trucks and the yet. boats, <laughs> and I know, but I mean, you 38 more units. Um, 80 more cars, almost, kind of math. Um, parking, blah, blah, blah. I know we don't know what the development could even possibly look at, but that's 38 more units. But they're gonna, by city requirements, there's gonna have to be enough space to provide for adequate parking based upon our current criteria of the city. And so there's gonna be parking, otherwise it won't get approved through the planned site development process. Mm. Okay. But if anybody else have any conversation before we vote? Uh, I mean, I, this is just this is a hard. It's a hard one. It's a hard. It's, it's hard a hard line. Okay, so I am coming back to the the idea of yeah, those forty 
units and applying the code, which it, then the code doesn't say it says health and welfare of the community. It does, doesn't specify, and this isn't my opinion, it's just the code doesn't say the health and welfare of the immediately surrounding community. It says the health and welfare of the, welfare of the community. So this all, the decisions are always, the application, in my opinion, is about making a, this general judgment of balancing the goals of the community as the whole um, and the master plan um, and the citizens that came out. And we always, I think, when these have come up in the past, I think when we've struggled to make the decisions, we've said what very concrete things can we point to as evidence, even if that is brought, you know, if that is brought from the community members and that is something which is tangible and we can point to or if it's brought from Scott's review. I mean, what we're always looking for in the interpretation is this stuff is not, is something hard, which is not, you know, tries to go beyond our inclination um, to point to about um, the impact. And so I'm going back to the things that folks raised, um, the height of the building behind there, um, that is not impacted. Um, the, the, the increase in the traffic would be, <coughs> Um, I mean, you can do the percentage wise if there's, I forget how many apartments, cars we were talking about or units. I mean, the percentage <clears throat> increase in traffic would be small versus if it was left at R3A and it went up to R4. Um, but the, you know, it does seem like those, I mean, the traffic, I do think what Delphine and Jan are saying is right. I mean, if you live in that neighborhood and there's plus or minus, 70 cars going down those streets. Um, Makes a difference. That, that does seem like a tangible, you know, impact. And also most of these hearing, I will say, <clears throat> it's, it's often black and white too that we know that we're leaning one way or another for certain reasons. And to me, and again, no offense to the African, I have very high respect for you. Um, but just flexibility is not reason enough for me to change a zoning, in my opinion. Um, I understand where that flexibility can, can come from, but as we change the zoning, we have no control of what happens so, later. So at this time, the applicant is clear that he doesn't even need it, he just wants the flexibility, right, if needed. So I just, I'm, I'm not seeing enough reasons on my end to, to vote and say, yes, this makes so much sense. And for me, it's rare, I always know. But today, I, I don't have enough. I'm gonna, I think I, by thinking it through but about the balance and the evidence in there, um, again, we've had cases where we try to make a similar decision, but we, to me, the difference is we had not, and then last week, we had, I think, structurally similar decisions, but there was not, we did not have, um, we did not have, to me, what does count as evidence that of, of the community saying that it impacts them in a concrete way, and to me, that, um, that counts or something. So. That's why we're here. Yep. Well stated. Yeah. No. Okay, so I think we're ready for a vote. Yep. So all those in favor of the motion? Yeah. Aye. 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 All the, okay. And all those opposed? Would nay. <laughs> nay. So we're three and three. So Ben, give us some advice. Uh, since we had an even number of commissioners tonight, I wondered if we wouldn't have a tie vote. I believe in the event of a tie, the motion fails. You'll need a new motion. So we could do an additional motion. And, and of course, the opposite we can probably guess would also be 3-3. Three, three. So what happens if we can't come to consensus and there's no, there, were just, there would be no action in that case? Okay. Um, may, I, may I really quickly though? I will ask, I mean, I think the three of us have voiced why we were voted this sure. way and there's no reason. I mean, can you share with me because I'm so on the fence? Like, just tell me why did you vote this way? I think that my biggest impact is to think about the hundreds and it's literally hundreds of houses that are coming, that are coming on East Miami. They are going to be built in the next decade roughly and that's that's a rough time frame we don't know how fast if they will the truly be built yes. yes if the economy doesn't fail that's a good point um, so we don't the, know it's not here yet those houses are coming those cars are coming that that, that density is coming to the east uh, 38 more houses within this central area does not seem to be that big of a dramatic impact um, 
as Scott pointed out, if it is the morning traffic, there is a great way to get out of that neighborhood by taking a right onto Miami and then going through that roundabout. And that's that's only you only need to add that traffic onto um, onto Org, no, um, onto Stafford if it is during the morning traffic. Otherwise, ideally, you could turn left out of that neighborhood if you do need to go south. Um, so I think the traffic is manageable, and I don't see the negative impact with 38 more houses, is, is the simple answer for me. Okay. That's where my, my so I just don't see the Okay. Um, what? Can you ro can you turn your microphone on? Oh. I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, I haven't. Okay. I I agree. I don't see a reason why the, the 38 extra homes are going to cause that big of, of an issue. I. Um, as far as the traffic goes, it's going to be a traffic study that's going to control a lot of what's going to be built there. Uh, we don't even know what's going to be built there. It could be 10 years before something's built there. We have no idea on that. I think to limit what can be built there right now, um, we, we, I don't agree that we should limit what that property can do at this point. You can the mic. I am. Okay. <clears throat> so is there an additional motion or any more discussion? I stand with how I voted. Can you give us a, if, if you're supporting it, go ahead. So, okay, I have a point, real quick. If it doesn't matter, 38 or 30 less, why not 30 less? I mean, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> If the extra or um, not, because, because the demand is fulfilled with hundreds. right to ask this question and to put it before the city if he wants right. to rezone it. Correct. And I think that is his right, and I kind of agree that that is his right. That well, that his is right is to ask. It doesn't mean, you know. Right, but right. I agree with him. I, 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 I don't disagree with him. I don't think 38 is going to make that big of a difference. Well, so if it doesn't make a big of a difference, and we're the only ones who actually made a motion and, and seconded, then if it doesn't make a difference, why not go with it? I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, this I don't think, again, we're not really coming back to the, having the discussion in a way which is, you know, applying the facts that we've heard tonight to the yes. code. And I'll say, on the other side, I mean, to some degree, <coughs> so, um, Notwithstanding what I said previously or in, in how I voted, um, I think the consideration, you know, to be made is for the opposing motion um, is again that the that the welfare clause in the code does not, and again I don't uh, mean to cause anyone offense, but you know there there are decisions that are made, for, you know, um, to be honest, um, as I take it, with the it's the community at large, and so certainly the immediate concerns. Um, of the residents in the neighborhood uh, weigh strongly in that. Um, but workforce housing, having um, people that can work in the jobs and not having um, open positions, and you know, all the reasons that the city, through uh, a lengthy process of public support, came up with a comprehensive plan with these goals, um, you know, it's weighed against the, the welfare of, of the community as, as well. And I think that's, um, in my mind, how you can get to the other um, how I could see myself getting to the other side of, of the vote as well. So. Mr. Chairperson, let me yeah. see if I can help you all. What I see here is obvious. We, we have an even number of commissioners. We're split 3-3. Three, three. Um, you all are uh, reiterating your positions. That's, of course, fine. But uh, at this point, you really have a third option that no one has discussed. Let me go over that and see if it helps you to, to move this forward. Um, so I'm looking at uh, Municipal Code Section 4-4-31, subsection G. Uh, I'll just read this to you, okay? It says, the review board, that's you all, may approve the requested action only upon a finding that all applicable criteria and requirements of these zoning regulations or other city ordinances have been met. If it determines that such criteria have not been met, the application shall be denied. The application may be granted 
upon conditions or limitations which the review board determines are necessary in order to ensure that the applicable criteria are met. Such conditions or limitations shall be provided to the applicant and interested parties in writing as part of the decision. Um, the decision of the review board with respect to requests for uh, approval of a variance or conditional use shall be final. Uh, see here, it's going on into things that aren't relevant to us. So the point here that I'm trying to bring up is that you could perhaps play around with the idea of adding conditions, things like that, to reach some kind of a compromise and get a majority vote for conditions something. Conditions to the applicant? To be, no, conditions on the uh, decision to, uh, I would assume, approve. A condition on the recommendation. Correct. So that's what I'm getting at here. I'm proposing some kind of leverage for a compromise. So we can actually do a with. condition on a rezone request? This would be a condition. It would be, yeah, it would be a condition on a rezone. Uh, you all are telling me we can't do that. Why do you, why do, you do this? Yeah, and to to our legals, um, you know, credit here, we we could do conditions in theory. There could be a motion set on that. Um, regardless of the motion tonight, you know, it will go in front of council as a recommendation from planning commission. So they will still see what staff has recommended here as as to the what the staff report states. Uh, there could be a recommendation of denial from planning commission if it's a three three vote. Um, there could be a recommendation of approval if there was a 4-2 vote, um, or there could be a motion to make conditions upon that rezone request. That is not ideal, I will say, from a, a regulation standpoint, from a staff standpoint, but it's certainly something that could be feasible. That would also have to be a 4-2 or, or higher vote as well. Um, I'll let legal jump in if I missed anything there. Can it be like one or the other with a note to council saying that it was a split vote? They, they will see the minutes uh, of this meeting, so they will see what that vote is. That will also be displayed in the staff report um, as to, to what that vote looked like. Um, but ultimately, it will show what that recommendation from Planning Commission was. So, correct. Here's another quirky idea. Are we allowed to force our seventh person to sit and watch the video to hear the whole, all the testimony? And thus, if we do a continuance tonight, Ultimately, we then make a final decision two weeks from now. And why I'm saying forcing them to watch the video is just so they can hear the impact of the community. They can hear our discussion so that they are brought up to speed on the, the, the because we don't necessarily want to force our citizens to come out two weeks from now and go through this whole process again. What do you think? It's an excellent idea, but I think it's very problematic. Um, <laughs> I would not recommend that. Okay. Thank you for your thoughts. Where are you? So what happens if we do, we said there's three options, approve, deny, conditions. What happens if we don't do any of those things? We don't end the, you don't end the meeting. <laughs> and all this has been a waste of time, yeah. I would like to, I would like to make a comment. This is not going to be popular. But when we were going through a, a process very similar to this some time ago with a very large group of people that were clearly very distressed about what was happening in their neighborhood, we're talking about hundreds of people that showed up on Zoom to object. We were told then that we were not to respond to the public input that we were to go by the comprehensive plan and the code. So I resent a little bit about what was just said tonight about us, the popularity vote here. I really have some feelings about that. Of course I feel for these people. 
Yes, they did come out tonight, but I've been told clearly in the past that we do not, that's not what, what we're to make our decision based on. That, that's acceptable practice because what we're looking at from a code standpoint is specific criteria, right? Uh, we, we are looking at criteria based on what the comprehensive plan states and what, what our code states uh, that, that we follow. And yes, there is always going to be contentious meetings um, it moving forward and this evening, of course. Um, and, and that's the difficult part of being a planning commissioner, of course, is, is hearing that testimony. But at the end of the day, I think that you know, uh, when we're looking at a, a legal basis for decision making, it should be based on facts in the code. And if those code requirements are not met, then that should be, I think, clearly articulated. Um, but I guess I'd probably defer maybe a little bit more to legal here. I could have said it better myself, I agree. But I'd chime in on one piece. So there's a difference between um, evidence and popularity. So I think it's important to distinguish. So the public um, feedback, they're, they know the neighborhood, they know the area, they're presenting evidence. and things that are brought so that's the evidence can be considered because those are part of your criteria so what you're taking from the from the public are you know the evidence what you can't do is say well they don't like it so i can't approve it that's that's a difference between evidence and popularity so i think that's an important distinction to, to remember in that when you're talking about that and i'll go even further i mean sometimes the, the public will prevent will present evidence that then is taken into account in various city reviews but we've talked about this a lot that 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 the city review does not cover like how the city staff interprets operationally what's in the code in terms of the review is not is not completely specified in the code in a determinate way, um, and so anyway, it just sort of gets to Scott's point that not not just looking for hard evidence, but what's what's the evidence being presented um, in the meeting by staff and by public, and then again, is that addressed in a way which mitigates their concern in in review that's done by the city or not? I see. Uh, Legals. I, on the other hand, no, what, okay. what yeah. evidence, yeah, I'm, I'm done. And, and they're I'm just kind of some <clears throat> precedent, too. So, I mean, public comment has steered and helped almost every, pro, you know, every major subdivision over the last, you know, year, two years as we're getting into this big building boom. Um, there have been a lot of tweaks made from public comment and things that even, you know, like, staff weren't aware of or the applicant wasn't aware of. So, I, I think it's definitely not ignored by any means. It's, it's uh, evidence presented. <clears throat> You know, and the, and the comprehensive plan is a guiding document. It's not something that we have to say because it's stated in the comprehensive plan, we have to go that route. I mean, that's, and if the public doesn't have a chance to come and talk to us and we don't listen to that and, and yeah, and not take a popularity vote, then what good is it to have them come? I mean, seriously. Well, but they, they present evidence and we've seen the evidence. And so to me, I always think about the justice balance, right? So I hear the applicant with his evidence, and then I hear what I'm here for is to represent the public, and I hear the evidence on both sides. And again, this is my first time um, really experiencing that, that in my opinion, there's just not enough on, on his scale for me to lean that way. I just, and so I, I don't need to beat like a drum or anything like that. I just don't know what to do next. What do we do next? Well, I see that when they normally want to go up and call in the short time that I've been here, it's because they want to make more units. They want to hear. They, they, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. One more time here. Um, in the other zoning request that I've been involved in, the applicant, the reason that they're doing this is because they want more units in there. They want more space. So to me, for him, for the applicant wanting to make more units just goes along with why he wants to rezone it. Now, now, can I ask, is it possible that I ask the applicant a question? Oh, sure. Can, does he have to come forward? Yes, please. What kind of going through all this? Do you have any time frame, or is this just something that you're looking at for the future? Could it be 10, 15, 20 years down the line? What are we looking at here? No, no. This is probably something that's going to hap would happen in the near future, and of course, the reason something hasn't already been presented to the city is because we don't know what we can present. I mean, there there's some things we could present now, but it's limited a little bit of how we can do it. Um, 
again, as had been talked about with the city. Um, and we've, we, we talked to the city about this because you got one parcel that is got two different zonings on there and how to keep that differentiated, it just cleans up what we're doing. We're trying to get it cleaned up so we can do, um, otherwise everybody's gonna be trying to figure out numbers because when the description, when it came back with this part, the line that's in, in this middle of the lot, I said, where's that line at? And there's not a clear answer where that line is drawn. We finally had to come up with something and just say, okay, here's where we think it is from the best evidence that we have out there. There's not a clear line drawn where that phase line is. And so we're trying to work with the city to help clean this situation up that has happened years ago. And so that, that's, that's part of the reason on, between the R4 and R3. But you also can see between the B4, the same part people own some of that other R4 that's next to the B4 on the other side, or on the south side of Pennsylvania. So again, it's helping clean and define that line better. Um, and and the, of course, it's definitely the density, you know, but just trying to make sure that we get that density. Not to say we're gonna fully capacitate that, but it does give us that um, ability to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. But but then that, the 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 owner of this could turn around and sell this. We could change the zoning, they could sell it, and it really doesn't matter. They could, it just opens it up to higher density, safety issues are still, that. yeah, it doesn't change anything at the end of the day, because it will someday if we see a planned development or something like that, but the zoning is the zoning. Yes, ma'am, that and is it's, correct. It's whatever, yeah, and sure, I mean, I'm sure the city would love that cleaned up and have it all one. Yeah, but, but, but on the same note, the, the next person could come back and just do townhomes. And same way with the current, current owner, could, they could just do townhomes if they uh, so desired. So it, it, it's trying to help clean things up to make it easier, so. Yeah, that just, that just makes my position more that um, it's gonna build soon is what I take it. That, that near, is the future. Is the plan. Yes, in the near and future. And if it was 10 years out, that might have an effect on the way I vote, but being in the near future doesn't change. There, there, there is a need today for uh, more housing. Yeah. And it, it, Delphine, as anyone else should know that, that there's a need for housing today. And so. Yes. Yeah. So. So, Ben and Jace, do you have any additional recommendations at this point? We we're just deliberating here ourselves on how this might look. So I can jump in as to, to what things can look like here. As we indicated, there's kind of three scenarios, right? Um, you know, one of those scenarios, I think, is, is just to move forward with the motion as, as it was presented. If that was the way we go, then it fails. Uh, this is, continues to go to council. We can deliberate after this meeting with the applicant if they want to come in with an amended application that you would essentially see uh, in the future if that's a possibility, or they would move forward with the rezone to council as it's presented tonight. Um, that's probably from a staff st standpoint the way I would go if there is no change in the voting situation uh, with, with Planning Commission this evening. Um, yeah. So is there an alternative motion potentially following staff's recommendation, or if there's not even a potential motion. That's a whole other issue. Is there a motion of any sort? Do we have to file a motion to get the outcome you talked about where we don't decide, it goes to city council, they can amend or not? Do we have to file a motion to make that happen? That just... I, I don't believe so because the motion was made and no second motion was made. So if there was a second motion that would... No, 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 I'm, I'm saying a different motion that was made. Um, so the vote was 3-3 three, three, um, as it stands, and that effectively fails because there is not a seventh planning commission member. If there's no follow-up to, or no secondary motion, um, then that motion carries through as a failed motion to city council as a rec recommendation of denial. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> We're, we're doing our best here to help you resolve this one way or the other. We love it when we see you guys huddled all together. <laughs> Is it about time to ask for a two minute break for bathroom break? Pardon me, uh, could you repeat that? I didn't hear you, ma'am. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> 
So what I would recommend It would be like a two minute break. I can go super fast. Are so just to be clear from a staff standpoint, has, is that the final yes. motion? Okay, so motion well, essentially uh, fails. It looks like that's our final motion. Okay. So we consider this agenda item closed and it moves on in a failed motion to the city council. A recommendation of denial, yes. correct. Yep. And we will take a recess of approximately two to five minutes. So. It is. Ask Jace. Ask Jace your question. You may ask Jace your question. Oh, yeah, that is really good. I'm sorry, remember that one? This happened before where people had an answer question. Question? 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 Question